verse 29 of Proverbs chapter 30, says, there are three things which are majestic in pace. Yes, four which are stately in walk. Something about the way these things move. Something about the way they walk. A lion which is mighty among the beasts and does not turn away from any. A greyhound, a male goat also, and a king whose troops are with him. You know, a lion. You think about that. King of the beasts, we say, right? You know, a lion doesn't give place to anything else in the forest. If it wants to go there, it's going to go there. It's just the way it is. It doesn't turn away from any other animal. This is the way we're supposed to be with Christ. This is the way we're supposed to be as Christians. We're supposed to be bold. Oh, harmless as doves. We're, we're not to be that ripping apart, you know, lion. But we're to be bold. We're to, be, we're to stand our ground. We're to have that uh, great confidence, unapologetically, uncompromising in our walk. This is kind of a picture of us, the gray hound. Now, in the Hebrew, you, you look at the Hebrew, and it's, it's a strutting bird. So I don't know where they got greyhound from. Maybe a greyhound was different in 1611 when they wrote these things. I, I don't know. But uh, you think about a rooster, maybe a banny rooster, you know. They got some attitude to them. You, you watch those things. The way a rooster carries itself around the, the chicken, you know, pen, <laughs> they... They're strutting their stuff. I'm it, and it ends here with me, you know. There's something about that. You think about a peacock, you know. They, they got that same kind of attitude thing going on. A male goat. Now, a male goat is smarter than the sheep. You got to understand that. And he's, he's like a leader. You know, if a male goat is in with the sheep, and then he goes out through the fence, all the other sheep will go out with him. Because he's a leader. Oh, look, somebody can do that. We're off, you know. And, uh, but they also offer protection to the flock. And then a king with his troops with him. No one rises up against the king when he's coming through and he's got the whole army with him, you know. That's something to behold. You know, guys, people are watching how you walk through this world. They're watching you. They, they've heard you're that Christian. <laughs> He's that Bible believer. You, you know him. You know? He's that guy that thinks Noah really happened. You know? He's that guy that thinks a donkey really talked to that prophet. He's the guy that thinks, 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 you know, God created in seven days, you know? And so they are watching you. <laughs> we should respond differently than the world does. We should walk differently than the world does. You know, there are sermons in all of these pictures. So the next time you read through this, you know, think about those things. Verse 32, if you have been foolish in exalting yourself. Anybody? Anybody got any hands? <laughs> or if you have devised evil, put your hand on your mouth. Let's do this, you know. <laughs> For, the, for as the churning of milk produces butter and the wringing of the nose produces blood, so the forcing of wrath produces strife. If you're full of pride, if you've been bragging about yourself, you know, or if you've been deceit, devising evil, If you haven't learned anything from the rest of the book of Proverbs, is kind of what he's saying, <laughs> isn't he? You know, here's, here's all of this wisdom we've just gone through. You know, if you haven't learned any of that stuff, do us all a favor and just walk around like this. Because we don't need to and we don't want to hear from you. For as the churning of milk produces butter, the wringing of nose, you know, that produces blood, so the forcing of wrath produces strife. 
If someone is so arrogant that they think they're the exception to God's word, well, I know that that affects everybody else, but I'm in a different place. You know, that really doesn't talk to me. That really doesn't affect me. When they won't take wisdom from the simple lessons, God's perfect word as he gives it to them, and they lift themselves up instead of allowing the Lord to lift themselves up or lift them up, then just cover your mouth. Because it's like churning milk, you know, twisting a nose. So transgressing divine wisdom produces strife. This is the book of wisdom. You know, isn't it funny? God gave you a book and it's filled with wisdom, but then he has a very specific book that's just all wisdom. <laughs> This book is not for fools. It's for the wise people, right? And now Proverbs 31. Probably the most famous proverb per chapter of anyone, right? I mean, I remember there was a time in my life, 10 years or so, that I read a proverb every day of my life. If it was the fifth, I read the fifth proverb. You know, I, and, you know, every once in a while, I'd learn how to be a woman, you know? Oh, this is what a godly woman looks like. This is what a virtuous wife, you know. And I would learn all of that stuff. But, uh, you know, we're going to get into that. But first we've got to get to verse 10 because there's some stuff between 1 and 10. It says, The words of King Lemuel, the utterance or the prophetic word which his mother taught him, what my son and what, son of my womb, and what, son of my vows? Do not give your strength to woman, nor your ways to that which destroys king. kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes intoxicating drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the justice of all the afflicted. Give strong drink to him who is perishing, and wine to those who are bitter of heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty, and remember his misery no more. Open your mouth for the speechless, and, ca and the cause of all who are appointed to die. Open your mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and the needy. It's interesting, this is written from the perspective of a king's mother warning him about two vices in this life, two issues in this life. Women, women plural. Lust, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, you know. And then alcohol, intoxication. My son, she says, if you're going to rule a nation, you've got to learn how to rule over these two things in your life. There are two things in a man's life that need wisdom, that need to be ruled over. You know, this, this Lemuel, it's a mystery. Nobody knows who Lemuel is. There is no king of Israel ever named that. But most believe... It's a picture of a mother and a son without identity on purpose. So we can all put ourselves in there, right? But it may be speaking about Solomon. Now, the ancient Jewish writers said there were six names that Solomon went by. He went by Solomon. He went by Jedidiah, the name that God calls him. He went by oh, Koalif. He went by Ben Lahau. He went by Agar. You'll see that name in, in, chapter 20, in chapter 30. And he went by Lemuel. All used of Solomon, apparently. And if that is true, then these are the words of Bathsheba. Think about that. These are the words of Bathsheba to her son. And it's an utterance, it's a prophetic word, and it's something that his mother taught him. You know, the book of Proverbs starts, my son, listen 
and it's the father speaking to the son and the word or the the book ends with his mother speaking to her son and it's it's interesting you know the role of parents in your life is so vital to you now i grew up with two parents but i grew up with one you know my mom was there my dad was never there my dad was out riding motorcycles or working or snow machines or you know with his friends or and and so i i grew up in a fatherless home sort of oh he was there <laughs> you should never know it you know and that character, that instruction, that training you get by having both of those there, I realize there are sometimes that there's only a single parent. Realize that's okay. Jesus grew up in a single parent home. He turned out okay, I think. You know, it is possible. So, so she starts talking to her son. When, when do you have that sex talk with your kid? You, have you gone through that? I remember going through that. It was the most nerve-wracking couple of weeks of my life. I'm like, oh, I need to talk to the boys. And, you know, and you're going through all of that stuff. It's like, man, it's crazy. Today, 50% of all kindergarten kids have a cellular device. Why? I don't get it. I don't understand what parents are thinking. 50% of six-year-olds have a cellular device, and 50% of those have surfed pornography. 50% have encountered pornography on the Internet. That's not the great place to look at it, you know, to see it, to encounter what sex is and what, what happens there. You don't want to jump in and teach your kids all the things about sex too early, but you also don't want the world to teach them everything there is to know, so you've got to draw that line somewhere. You've got to have that information. How hard was this for Bathsheba to talk to her kid about sexual purity? <laughs> this is the woman that goes out on a rooftop next to the palace, you know, palace is next door. And she goes out on her rooftop and takes a bath. And probably not the best idea you've ever heard to do. Ladies probably shouldn't, should not to do that, you know. The king, the king had decided, man, I've fought all my battles, so I'm going to stay home this weekend, you know. And he's, he's bored, so he's up walking around. Gets up on the roof, he looks over, there she is, bathing, Bathsheba, you know, that's her, you know. <laughs> I always love that picture because it's dangerous when you're a man and you're not involved in the battle. Because then you're just home wandering around and, you know, a Bathsheba thing could happen. He sees her, he sends for her, he lies with her, you know. She conceives. Now we've got problems, you know. Uriah, one of David's mighty men, is out on the battle lines. He calls for him, brings him home, gets him drunk, and then tries to send him home to his wife. Maybe he'll sleep with his wife, and you know we can blame it on that. And he won't do it. He's such an honorable guy. He, he won't go there. He says, man, all of my buddies are out there on the front lines. You want me to go lay with my wife? Uh -uh, I ain't going to do it, you know. So David sends him back with a letter to the guy over the war saying, put this guy in the hottest part of the battle and let him die. Withdraw from him and let him die. This trouble with women and this trouble with drinking for a man is a dangerous place. You ever been into women, drugs, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll? Do you live through that age? Because I lived through that age, you know? Do you think now you're disqualified to talk to your kid about it? I'm sorry, you're wrong. You're more qualified to talk about it because you've walked through it. Man, don't go there. There's a bunch of landmines out there. It will chew you up. It will blow you up. It will spit you out. It will take you years and years, if ever, 
to get out of that and to get away from that. God is so gracious to forgive us, to cleanse us, you know, to still use us. Have you realized we're all adult children of sinning parents? Your parents weren't perfect, were they? No, my parents weren't perfect. Their parents weren't perfect. So you're just a little sinner off the old block, you know. She, she says in verse 2 and 3, What my son and what son of my womb and what son of my bowels, do not give your strength to women nor your ways to that which destroys king. She's, she's seeing something in her life and she's going, what, what's going on? What, what's happening to you? What, where are you being drawn to? What's going on in your life? He's coming of age, and she warns him about women, plural. <laughs> and then in 4 to 7, she warns him about the intoxicants, alcohol, the biggest, craziest drug on planet Earth, you know? Is she seeing the effects, you know? Son, I don't want you to go that way. Son, I don't want you to get involved in this. Yes, your father and I lived through it. We survived it, but barely. You know? These things destroy kings. Study David's life after his fall with Bathsheba. Never got to where it was. And his life turns into a nightmare. Sons are dying left and right. They're trying to take over the kingdom. They're doing all kinds of crazy things. You know, one, one son sleeps with his sister. And then, the, you know, you get, it's like, wow, where did all that stuff come from? Sin. Sin, you know. Do not give your strength to women. It's interesting, that word strength. Look down at verse 10. Who can find a virtuous woman? That's our word, virtue. That word means a warrior. That word means a man or a woman of honor, of purity, of strength, one willing to stand in the battle and fight. That's what virtue used to mean. Now it just means pure. Yeah, it doesn't mean that. It means strong. You know? Did Solomon listen to this advice? <laughs> 700 wives, 300 concubines. My son, don't get messed up with them women, plural. <laughs> well, I got to go try this out, you know. Doesn't seem like it. And his life ended how? In disaster. 1 Kings 11. But King Solomon loved many foreign women as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Sodomites, the Hittites, from the nations whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with these women, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these women in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart, just like God said would happen. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God as his heart, as the heart of David was. <laughs> Don't you love the comparison? Here's Solomon. His heart's not loyal. But the, as David was. You ever read the story about David? Him and Bathsheba just, you know? And you're thinking, how is that a loyal heart? Here's how that's a loyal heart. Because David was a sinner. And David sinned in front of his God. David rebelled against his God. David hardened his heart against his God. David repented to his God. And David returned to his God. David never left his God. He always had the same God. Whereas Solomon left his God. 
Then she moves ahead to alcohol. It should not be among civil leaders to drink alcohol. No minister or priest was to come under its influence. Remember Nabal and Abihu? When you read that story, you know what the, what the correction was immediately after? It talked about alcohol. Priests are not to be drinkers. They apparently took that strange fire and drunk before the Lord. Now in America, the highest place of alcohol consumption per capita, Washington, D.C. Isn't that great? Your civil leaders, they're drinking it up. You know? It says here that if they do that, they are going to pervert justice. I'm, I'm glad we haven't got to that stage yet, you know? Sons, daughters, if you learn to control these desires, you will be in control of the world. The whole world is your oyster then because you have these big issues controlled. Think about the statistics for alcohol. Vietnam, nine years long. 58,220 people died. Servicemen died. Casualties. Over the same nine years, two million people died here in America from alcohol. We were all in an uproar about Vietnam. 58,000. Two million died here. The last 50 years, we've lost more than World War I and World War II combined to alcohol. 50% of all traffic deaths, alcohol-related. 80% of all criminal cases, alcohol-related. 50% of teen driving deaths, alcohol-related. 77% of high school kids today, are drinking alcohol, 77%. 48% of eighth graders are drinking alcohol. 500,000 kids between nine and 12 are alcohol dependent today in America. A half a million kids, nine and 12. One of every 14 people that tastes alcohol becomes addicted to alcohol. It's a big deal, right? I just watched this thing on, on the YouTube channel. The YouTube, right? I was on the YouTube the other day on the internet box thing, you know. And I watched this thing called Chronic State. And it was about Colorado. The last four years since they said marijuana is okay, let's do that. In my day, when we went, you know, the THC content in the stuff we were smoking was between two and five percent THC. The stuff they produce in Colorado today is between 70 and 98 percent THC. They have become the drug capital and the drug exporter for the rest of the world in that drug. In my day, nobody got addicted to pot because the THC wasn't high enough. Today it's one in four. One in four. And you know, when your kids are playing with, with uh, pot today, you're not looking for a reefer laying around or a little baggie, you know, half a bag. You're looking for a little black ball about the size of the head of a pin. And they just superheat that. And they're there. You know, it comes in wax and this paste. And it comes in all of this stuff. Go online, watch that movie, Chronic State. You know, Hard crime, 
up 20% in four years, 20%. You can't go walking through the national forest anymore. You know how Colorado is one of the most beautiful places on the whole planet? Don't go walk around there. You'll die. Because there are all these private growers out there, and if you come into their field, and they're just out there in the middle of the forest somewhere, they will kill you. You know? Verses 8 and 9. You need a clear head if you're going to be a king because you need to do this. You need to open your mouth for the speechless. In the case of all who are appointed to die, open your mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and the needy. That's, that's why a leader, that's why I don't believe pastors spiritual leaders should ever drink you need a clear head you need to go about this thing you know and now from 10 on it's it's put into a, a a way that they could it's a it's an acrostic so every verse starts with the next letter of the hebrew alphabet so you could memorize this and apparently he has because he's written it down you know something his mom gave him as a kid now, I just want to warn you ladies, we get into this, this is not a real woman, okay? This is like the, the highlight reel of a woman, you know, or, or something. It says, who can find a virtuous, remember virtuous? Strong, a warrior. Yes, she is pure and clean and lovely. But she is standing her ground. She's doing what it takes, you know. For her worth is far above rubies. This is the woman Solomon apparently never found. Out of a thousand women, he never found this one. One who, who fights for her husband. One who fights for her kids. One who fights for her beliefs. She's, she's God's warrior, you know. If you're a guy and you're looking for a woman, read this. Take this in. You're looking for some of these attributes. You're looking for this woman. I know you're looking for this woman. You know, you need to be looking for this woman. Because this stuff, those curves will change on you. Right? We're going to get to that stage. It says, her worth is more valuable than rubies. She's worth more than being a millionaire, you know. She's worth more than all of that money. And she is both a Mary and a Martha. I know we'll get in here, and man, it seems like she's a Martha. She's doing, 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 doing. She's got this list of stuff to do. But she's a Mary. You get to, to verse 25, and it gets deep into Mary, you know. She's a spiritual, you know, depth too. Now, it doesn't say that they're not out there. But it says they are rare. These kind of women are rare. And one of the reasons they're rare is they're seldom looked for. We're looking for this one instead of this one. It says in verse 11, The heart of her husband safely trusts her, so he, so he will have no lack of gain. You know, I love this about my wife. I absolutely trust her. There's no, no ifs, ands, or buts. I, you know, we, we had a little accident back in 2000. We settled with the insurance company, did all that stuff. And, and you know, they, they wrote us out a check. And there was a couple of zeros on the check. And they were going, Mark, what do we do? Can we give it to you? Uh, and my disability was all over the place. I, I don't know if you can give it to me. I said, just make it out to my wife. And my lawyer went, oh, I never said to do that, you know? And I'm like, I didn't ask you. I said, just make it out to her. She's faithful. You know, and she got that check. She didn't run away. So she must be good to keep her, you know? <laughs> she brings peace into my house. She loves peace as much as I love peace. We love those times where we're just sitting there and nothing's going on. It's like, 
It's so nice. It's quiet. There's no crazy stuff going on, you know. There's joy in our house. Man, as a married guy, is there anything better? Peace. Just peace. Valentine's Day is coming. There's no peace at your house, is there? There's peace in my house. You know why? Because my wife thinks Valentine's Day is stupid. Thank you, Jesus, for that one. You know, I got that one, you know. Her character should be the first thing you look at. What does she look like? I don't know. But her husband has a keeper, you know. Verse 12, she does him good and not evil all the days of her life. You remember your wedding vows? For better, for worse, richer, poorer, sickness and health. You, you guys remember those? And all you heard was better, richer, you know, health, you know. That's all you heard. You didn't hear the other half? Boy, when the other half hits, hits your life, you, you want to keep her, you know? And sometimes it takes 20 years to get to that other side, and sometimes it takes 20 minutes after those vows. And you're already thinking, what, did, what have I just done, you know? Mine stayed with me after getting bad news. You know, after a wreck, um, I thought, I sat around for a couple of months going, how in the world am I going to take care of this woman the rest of her life? And it turned out that she got better and I didn't, and now it's how in the world is she going to take care of me the rest of her life? You see, i got to keep her. <laughs> He's the half brain idiot. I got to take care of him. You know? A virtuous woman fights. She stands. She's going to do him good all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. She does whatever she can for the family. You know? If she needs to work, she's out there working. If she needs to produce, she's producing. If she needs to invest in the house and do all of this stuff, you know. Remember, this is the goal. This is the epitome of a woman. Guys, let me just mention this to you. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for. No husband has ever met that ever in the history of the world, right? This is their, this is their epic goal. You know, just because it ain't never happened doesn't mean it still isn't the goal. Doesn't mean it still isn't the target. This woman works willingly, you know, it literally, in the Hebrew, she's delighted to do it. Verse 14, she is like the merchant ship. She brings her food from afar. I picture those Middle East women, and they had to walk out to the well with the pitcher thing on their head, and they, they had to fill it up with water and then walk back. And, you know, she gets home to big, stupid, dumb walks, you know, and dummy walks over and knocks the pitcher over and all the water. Hey, honey, could you go get more water? It, you know how far it is? You know, this is a woman willing to bring home the bacon, bring home the water. She's doing whatever she can. Verse 15, she also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and a portion for her maidservants. This is where my wife differs from this woman. My wife hates mornings. I get it. You know, her, she spends her mornings with it. Spells her mornings with a U. Morning, you know. I gotta get up, you know, that kind of thing. I, uh, I remember working at the site and I'd have to get up early, you know. And if I wanted breakfast, she was happy to fix me breakfast the night before. And sometimes if I was really good, she wouldn't pour the milk on it, you know. <laughs> but Brenda's idea of rising while it is still night is it two o'clock in the morning? She's still up. You know, the old midnight oil still going. She's in there doing stuff and cutting and crafting. And, you know, oh, 
Man, what in the world? And her servants. She's taking care of her servants. Ladies, what's your servant? Is it your dishwasher? Is it your washing machine? Is it your dryer? Microwave? You know, what are your servants? Are you taking care of those things? Verse 16, she considers a field and buys it. From her profit, she plants a vineyard. This woman thinks beyond the normal range, right? She's thinking ahead. She's planning. She is considering a field. She's been driving by this place, looking over. There's a field. wonder what I could do with that. And she's processing it. She's going through all of these ideas. After prayer and reasoning and consideration, she acts. And when she acts, she jumps in with both feet. This is an investment into the household. Putting all you have into something extra, and she plants it. I so appreciate that. She's not the wife that says, Honey, you know what I think we should do? And when I say we, I mean you. You know what you should do, honey, is get that field down the street and then plow it, plant it, take care of it. And then, you know, when it makes money, then we could go on vacation or something. That's not her. She did it all. And it says that she made the money to buy the field with. She did it all, you know. Verse 17 she girds herself with strength and strengthens her arms. This is a good woman. Now, back in my unpolitically correct days, back when I was a teenager and we would watch the Olympics, you would see those girls from East Germany. You know the East German girl. She looks like a healthy, strong American man. You know. East, she good woman, you know. She can lift up a car, you know, change the tires. You know, that, that kind of woman. This girl's got some guns. Strengthens her arms, you know. She is a strong girl. Verse 18, she perceives that her merchandise is good and her lamp does not go out by night. Now, this is my girl. Her lamp does not go out. I'm, I've been in bed for hours by the time she comes in, you know. And I don't go to bed early. She just, she burns that midnight oil. She's reading, she's working, she's processing through things. She does all kinds of stuff, you know. She stretches out her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. Now she's a weaver. She's at the weaver at the loom, you know. Well, of course she is. If there's something to be done, this woman's doing it. She's out there shearing the sheep, and then she's, what am I going to do with all this? Well, well, I guess I'll spin it into this, and then once I spin it into that, I can't just give it to Lacey, you know, so I'm going to go home and knit. You know, I'm going to go home and put this thing together. Well, I wonder what she does in her spare time. You know, I read through this, and I just, I'm just crazy about what, the, what in the world. When does she sleep? She's up early. She stays up late at night. She's shearing sheep. She's doing it. There, there. She's working out, you know. She's got those guns going on. Verse 20. She extends her hand to the poor. Yes, she reaches out her hands to the needy. Solomon, find a woman like this that doesn't just think about herself, but is thinking about others. Notice the word, she stretches out her hand, she reaches out, you know, to take care of others. She knows, she understands this thing, to whom much is given, much is required. And she's living that, you know. America, that's us. To whom much is given, that's us, you know. Is your heart larger than your life? Can you see beyond this, you know? Do you have those horse blinders on? All you can see is you and your life? Or are you actually removing those blinders and seeing the world around you? 
Verse 21, she is not afraid of snow, that fool. She is not afraid of snow for her household. For all of her household is clothed with scarlet. I'm already afraid of snow. It's September, you know, we're getting near to the end of the and I'm already, oh, Lord, snow is coming. I can feel it in the morning, I get up, and the school weather has shown up, you know. It's funny, as soon as those kids go to school, the temperature drops like 20 degrees. It's like, what? Don't send the kids to school until December. And then bring them home December 1st, you know? This woman is strong. She has no fear. She is an East German girl, you know? She's clothed with scarlet. Literally, she's clothed with the best stuff. The best winter gear. What name do you put on that? You know? It could be translated, she's clothed with a double garment. She's got the inner clothing and the outer clothing. You know, she's ready. She's not afraid because she's prepared. Her household is prepared. Whatever comes, we got this handled. Verse 22, she makes tapestry for herself. Now she's embroidering. You know what? What kind of woman is this? Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her clothing is silk and purple. Expensive, nice stuff. Notice verse 25. Her strength and honor are her clothing. Oh, this is the stuff I wear, but what, what I really am is strength and honor. That's what I'm really wearing. That's what you really need to take note of. Not the silk shirt, but the strength and the honor of the person wearing it, you know? Her husband is known in the gates, and he sits among the elders of the land or, or the leaders of the land. This woman enables her husband to be all he can be. You know, we all know that thing, you know, behind every great man there is a greater woman. There's a lot of truth to that. He gets to sit among the elders, the leaders. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies sashes for the merchants. Now, this girl is a producing machine, isn't she? You just go home, you plug her in, she's just out there going, you know. Verse 25, strength and honor are her clothing and she shall rejoice in the time to come. This is what God has planted in her. And this is what causes everything else to happen in her life. She has strength, inner strength, and she has honor, wisdom. You know, she has this stuff going on. This is what she has clothed herself with. She's seen it out there. I want to be like that. She's brought it in. She's changed herself. She's made herself be this kind of girl. In our world... Clothing is our honor. Oh, you see my $200 tennis shoes? See my $900 suit? You know, our clothing is our honor. With her? No, she's clothed with honor. You know. <laughs> what a cultural difference between America and this girl. And the results? In the Hebrew, it says, she shall rejoice in the latter days. She's not afraid of what's coming next, what tomorrow holds, what the next day holds. She's not scared about taking her last breath <laughs> because she has laid up treasure in heaven, you know. She's blessed. She's been helping. She's been serving. She knows where she's going. Verse 26. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. You know, in Proverbs eleven twenty two, it says this. As a ring of gold in a swine's snout, so is a lovely woman who lacks discretion. You ever seen somebody from across the room and you go, wow, she's a keeper. She's a nice looking girl. And then you get over close to her and she's over there and just the filth and the junk coming out of her mouth and it just, whoop, whoa, that turned that off really fast. 
<laughs> That's enough of that, you know? It's like this beautiful gold ring in a pig's nose. You know, that's kind of a turnoff, you know. Here's this beautiful ornament. She's the exact opposite of that. She is beautiful inside and outside. It says she opens her mouth in wisdom. That means she also closes it in wisdom. Did you catch that? She doesn't say the stupid thing. She doesn't say the off-colored thing. She, she chooses not to do the other thing. And the law of kindness is on her tongue. Notice this. It's a law. It's not a suggestion. It's not a, you know, ah, I don't feel like being nice today. Don't you wish there were more kind people in this world. Just people that you can just walk up to and be real with and they're just real with you, but there's, there's this nice kindness to it. I wish there were a few more of those floating around. We should be those. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her house is moving according to her discretion. She's watching how it's flowing out and she's directing and guiding and giving paths to it. Have you noticed going through life that we're always rookies wherever it is we are right now? You know, when you were late teens and you're looking for a girl, you've never done that before, and so you're kind of a rookie at it. You don't know how. And then you get married. Well, you've never been married before, so you're a rookie at it, and you don't know how this thing actually works. And then, you know, just about the time you think you're starting to get a handle on that, then come along comes kid number one. You know, it's like, whoa, no, everything's in turmoil, and you're a rookie at it. And you got to learn, okay, here's what kid number one looks like. And then kid two, three, four, yeah, ah, you know, suddenly you're a rookie at 16 kids and all of this stuff going on. And then, you know, your first kid goes to junior high and you're a rookie at this, right? And you're trying to, you're trying to explain stuff to them and you don't know what you're talking about and they don't know what they're talking about. And, and then they go to high school, oh, I don't know, and then college and then they move, they start moving out. Well, I'm a rookie at this, and then grandkids start coming in. Have you noticed every place you have been in this life, you're a rookie? I think that's on purpose, by the way. Just about the time you get one phase figured out, here comes another phase. And she's not eating the bread of idleness. Facebook. Did I get anybody? Yeah! You know, I've been studying, studying this passage, and it says, you know, there is one who speaks like the piercing of a sword. Yeah! Did I get you? Because that hurts. Everybody's going, ow, that hurt. But the tongue of the wise promotes health. You know, here's, here's the thing. She's not gossiping. She's not spending all of her day on Facebook. She's not watching the soap operas, you know, as the stomach turns, episode 9,387, you know, because you may have missed out on 9,384. Verse 28, her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Kids often don't do this when they're still at home. <laughs> I don't know if you notice that, you know. But eventually, your kids will go, man, that mom, she was all over it. She, she was constantly doing this, constantly had that ready, was all over this, was watching over that, was doing all of this stuff. Your kids notice what you're doing. They just don't say it very often. Sometimes they don't even like it. But then they grow up and they go, man. Where'd that magic shampoo come from all the time, you know? Magic toilet paper, magic soap, you know? Magic car full of gas. Where, where all this stuff come from, you know? But they eventually wake up. Mom was amazing. 
You know why so many guys have this connection with their mom? Because they come to realize what real life is about and how hard it is. And they look over at mom and they go, man, she just choked on through. She just persevered. She just went for it. They recognize her. Even her husband, that big dumb ox, right? He praises her. Verse 29, many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. And you should circle this verse. Where did this verse come from? We've been talking about this woman from like a third person perspective, and suddenly first person shows up. And notice who's speaking here. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Who's calling her a daughter? Who's praising her? It's like God now interrupts this prophetic platform on women. And he says, man, I've had a lot of girls do really good. But you excel them all. How would you like to have God interrupt your day and say that to you? (laughs) Wouldn't you love to have him just stoop down one day and say, good job. Well done. Amazing job today. Every Christian in this room has that opportunity today. Every Christian in this room can have dad lean down and say, I see the fire, I see the struggle. Man, keep going, you're doing great. It's right here for the asking. Oh Lord, I am nothing like this woman. But Lord, I'd like to start to be, so Lord, could you bring a couple of these things to my mind and help me to begin to go that direction, you know? Would you help me? Would you change me? Would you grow me? Would you implement this into me? Because I've tried and it ain't happening when I'm doing it. And then, you know, probably the, the famous verse of the famous verse, or the famous chapter, charm is deceitful, And beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. Charm, favor, is deceitful. You can live your whole life trying to please other people, but it's a ruse, you know. It's a deception. We need to live our life to please one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And not care if, if my actions pleasing him pleased anybody else. But some ladies are really insecure. Have you noticed? And they need to learn to get their security, not from what the world thinks of them, but from what God thinks of them. You need to read through your Bible, read through the New Testament, and find those places where God says you're loved, you're beautiful, I love everything. I created you exactly the way you are. And you need to take those verses and live them out. I don't care what anybody else says. This is what my king says about me, and that's the way I live. That's who I'm going to be. And beauty, those looks, those curves, that color of hair, you know, that's temporary. I was listening to Joe Foch the other day, and he says, and, and the other point I want to make is beauty, it's temporary. And then the last point, beauty, is temporary. And then maybe one more time, beauty looks temporary. Let me just say it another way. Beauty is passing away. It's fading away. It slowly, in most cases, fades away. But if you're living for that beauty, if you're living with that standard, I've got to look like this, I've got to be like this, or she's got to be like that, you know, 
That is one difficult master you've placed yourself under. <laughs> Some fake standard that you think needs to be your standard. The more you bow to that master, the more it demands of you in an ever-losing battle. Now, the other side is also true. She doesn't run around the house in her sheep shearing outfit, all sweaty and, you know, disheveled. And, you know, she, I just came in from the field, honey, come give me a hug. You know, you're like, you stink. You know, you need a shower. She wants her husband to remain interested. So she's wearing silk. She's wearing purple. She's still attractive to her husband. But she knows that outward beauty is passing, it's fading, and she's okay with that. <laughs> and as, as your beauty passes, girls, so does your husband's vision. You know? You can, you can take ease in that, right? But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. That's the high mark of this chapter. It's not any of those other things. Yeah, she was busy. She was doing. She was after it. And that is amazing when you find somebody that has some of those qualities. But here's the thing. The woman who fears the Lord... And that is never being afraid of God. That is not what the fear of the Lord means. The fear of the Lord means you want to be with him. You want him to walk with you. You want his presence with you at all times. You're not scared that you're going to take him to a place that he doesn't want to go to because you fear him. You want to please him. You want to put a smile on God's face. And if God is in you, and he is as a Christian. How do you put a smile on his face? You obey his commands, right? It's someone that wants to walk with Jesus, but understand that he is full of grace. He is full of mercy. Oh yeah, you blow it, but he still loves you. They're a real Christian. They want to be in the presence of Christ even though they're idiots. Even though they've blown it. Even though they can't do it perfectly. They still want him. They still need him. They still beg him to be right there. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Virtue spoken of throughout this passage, isn't something this woman gets up on the uh, rooftop of her house and says, I'm a virtuous woman! You know? It, is, it isn't on TV. It's walked out every day of her life in who she is and how she acts and what she does. That's how you see the virtue. That's how you tell who she is. You know, I get back to this idea of you young guys and you're going to go looking for girls and so you're going to go date. You realize dating is a lie, right? Because she's going to, hey, 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 mom, can I, I, I need some new clothes because I don't have anything to wear. And this guy, this really cute guy, asked me out. And, and so you're going to see her at her absolute best. Is she going to act like she does around the rest of the family? No, she's, she's going to act differently when she gets around you. Because she wants to impress you. And guess what you do? You guys. Dad, can I, can I borrow that car? My car is like a 68, you know. Yours is 2014, you know. And I, I'll wash it for you. A vacuum. You know, I'll take really good care of it. And then, Dad, can, 
Can I borrow like a uh, hundred bucks? Because yeah, you know, I, I, this this girl, man, she's an oh god, and I really want to impress her. So I was thinking maybe Jakers, you know, or something. You know, we go somewhere nice. You know, you realize all that's a lie, right? Because if you're really taking a girl out on a date, you're stopping in McDonald's, you know, Burger King. Can I supersize that for her? She's a special one, you know. <laughs> the way you check somebody out is see them in real life. Watch them in real life. See their character. Because this chapter is character you kings you leaders you civil leaders how do i know your character are you chasing the girls are you after the intoxicants you know or well pots pots it's okay now so it's all right it's not okay now are you looking at a girl watch how she lives is she ambitious is she out there doing she got a smile on her face and joy in her heart. Can you see Jesus in her life? If the answer is no, look on, right? Look further, because all that stuff you're looking at won't be in the same places 10 years from now. The way she lives will praise her life. That's the same look in the other way. The way a man lives will praise his life or curse his life. Which one is it? Because if you'd have met me when I was 20, you'd think, there goes another jerk on the hard road of life. And that was exactly the case. Some of you guys have such a head start on a guy like me. I didn't get saved till I was 33 years old. I never realized there was wisdom in a book that I could read and wouldn't have to go through the school of hard knocks to find it out. Guys, we've went through the whole book of wisdom. Chapter after chapter, verse by verse. Why? Because in here is life. And if you want to live life, you want this, not this. Because you just go about thinking that life's going to work out the way you're thinking, you know? It's kind of, a, kind of a dumb idea. I read this quote, or I heard this quote the other day, and it says, the more you do as you please, the less pleased you will be by what you do. That's a great quote. The more you do what you want to do, the less happy you will be. Boy, you could just write that over the Bible and say, sign in here. Try to pick something up from here. Try to live for somebody else. Try to live for Christ. Because when you lose your life, then you actually find it in Him. Lord, I just... Uh, I just thank you for your word, for the wisdom that you've so easily and freely given us. And God, I pray for the ladies in this congregation, Lord, that you would awaken them to the fact that you love them, that you have graced their lives, and that you care, and that you find them beautiful, amazing, diverse creatures under your hand. And Lord, would you help them to be satisfied there, content. And God, I pray for the guys. Oh, Lord, this book of wisdom was written to us. God, would you help us to check in and to check out some of the passages that have just stuck with us. Lord, allow us to learn from your school and not from this world's hard knock school because that will, uh, that hurts. 
Lord, I pray for the marriages. I pray for the singles. Lord, I pray, God, that your people would feel your touch. And Lord, just be full of joy. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.